After the conquest of Canaan, depicted in the book of Joshua, the people of God spent around 350 years in a despicable cycle of joy and sorrow detailed in the book of Judges. Judges tells the sad story of the people doing what was right in their own eyes, which led to constant misery and the need for a deliverer. In simplest terms, the book of Judges reveals how the Lord's people are half-hearted at best and full-blown idolatrous at worst. There's an endless cycle of unfaithfulness, discipline, regret, deliverance, and unfaithfulness again. As soon as a judge dies, the people forget the Lord. This brings us to an important point. The story of Judges should ultimately make us long for the true and better Deliverer, Jesus. Jesus is the King who not only rules over His people with justice and equity, but also with grace and mercy. He not only delivers us from our great enemies, sin and death, but also changes our hearts so that we no longer deeply desire to do what is right in our own eyes. By God's grace, Jesus changes us to desire to do what is right in His eyes. He does not simply deliver us for a time, but buys for us an eternal redemption through His cross and resurrection. He is the King who, at great cost to Himself, delivers us from all danger and rules over us in all joy. He is the eternal King we need and long for. Some Old Testament books of the Bible we come to and we see the Lord Jesus being promised in a very explicit way. If, if you go to the book of Genesis, you'll see promises that God makes to Abraham saying that he's going to make him a great nation and then he's going to bless the entire world through Abraham's lineage. And we know ultimately, the Apostle Paul makes that clear in the book of Galatians, that he was talking about Jesus, that Jesus would be a Jew. Jesus would be born in the lineage of Abraham, and he would bless the entire world as the Savior. Paul even points out that there it said, my offspring, not offsprings, not plural, but he's saying he's talking about the offspring that's going to come from the line of Abraham. And so that's Jesus who's promised. Then you go to books like Exodus, and we see more of a story form. It is a story. It's a real story that happened. But we see Jesus revealed in that way because the people of God are in slavery in Egypt, and they need to be set free and the Lord sets them free finally on that fateful night when His people took shelter under the blood of the Lamb. They were spared the judgment they deserved, and they were set free to then go out and worship the Lord and then go and receive the law of the Lord. And we see that Jesus is typified in that way. Something happens in history, like a lamb being slaughtered and all of God's people not getting the death they deserve because they trusted in the blood of the lamb. See, that's about Jesus as well. And then you move to the book of Deuteronomy and you find things in Deuteronomy chapter 18, such as the Lord promising through Moses. Moses says, the Lord will one day raise up a prophet like me from among your brothers and you must listen to him or you'll die. And in the book of Acts, we're told by Peter that Moses was talking about Jesus. You go into the book of Leviticus and you see the whole sacrificial system that sin deserves death. And if we are not going to die, someone or something has to die in our place. And so bloody sacrifices over and over again for 1,400 plus Years. That's what the book of Leviticus deals with largely, that the wages of sin is death, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so in that book, we see Jesus promised, or we start to long for Him. 
We start to long for a sacrifice that we wouldn't have to do every day or once per year on the Day of Atonement. We start, or we should long for a sacrifice that happens once for all to deal with our sin. The point is this. Every book you come to in the entire Bible is about Jesus. Especially it's harder for people to understand the Old Testament. Every book in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, the New is clear. I mean, the New Testament, the Gospel accounts, well, that's about Jesus because it's eyewitness testimony of what He did and said and His death and resurrection. Acts is what He continued to do through the work of His Spirit and His people as they went and shared the Gospel. Then there, we have letters and letters and letters written to churches who love and serve Jesus and how they should act and how they should trust Jesus. Then we have Revelation, which is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's like, well, yeah, the whole New Testament's about Jesus, but so is the Old. Jesus says that if you understand the Old Testament, you would understand that it's all about Him. Paul tells Timothy that the sacred scriptures you have, Timothy, which at that time was just the Old Testament, are able to make you wise for salvation. My point is this. All of the Bible is about Jesus. And every book in the Old Testament is ultimately about Jesus. Some making us just long for Him. Some outright promising Him. And then some, in a different way, like the book of Judges, we aren't really given specific promises about the coming Savior King, Jesus. But more than anything, we are meant to read these stories, these real stories that happened, and go, oh my gosh, we need a King that will lead us where we should go. And we need a Savior who can change us from the inside out. Every story we will read in Judges you and I should go, my gosh, we need a good king. We need a good savior who won't die and who won't be fickle and half-hearted in his devotion or her devotion to God. We need a true king. So the book of Judges should make us long for Jesus to come and rescue us. It also teaches us as Christians how to live. We see mostly negative examples. So it doesn't teach us how to live as much as it teaches us how not to live. So Lord willing, we're going to spend the next 17 weeks looking at this book. And I, I won't ask you to stand or raise your hand, but in your mind, just think of this. How many sermons, and I mean like an expository sermon that has a passage and is teaching you the passage and applying it, how many sermons from the book of Judges have you heard in your life? Just think about that. Okay, then get rid of any sermons about Samson. How many sermons in the book of Judges have you heard in your life? Okay, then get rid of Gideon. How many sermons about the book of Judges have you heard in your life? Do we even know who Othniel is? Ehud? Most of us don't because this is a book that's really just kind of set to the side and we go, this is insane. There's a lot of crazy stuff that happens. The other night before we went to bed, I was reading the Bible to my kiddos and we were reading the story of Ruth and Boaz. And that whole book begins with, in the time of the judges. So the book of Ruth, which is right after Judges, happens during this period of the judges. And so then we didn't actually get to our Bible story because we just pulled back and said, do you remember what that is, what Judges is about? And I started telling them the craziest stories I could remember from the book of Judges. And my oldest daughter, Lila, goes, I, I don't want to talk about this anymore. These are scary. And they are. Some of them are terrifying. Adonai Bezek, did you catch what happens to him? Just wait till we get a little bit further. The whole point of this book is to make us long for Jesus, the true and better King who will change us from the inside out and will rule over us with mercy, peace, grace, and justice. But before we get into the specifics of this, we have to understand the whole context. So look at verse 1 of the whole book. 
verse 1 just begins with this. The writer says, and we don't know who wrote it. Most people say it was Samuel. We don't know exactly who wrote it. We know that Jesus knew and believed it was the Word of God and is the Word of God, so we do too. After the death of Joshua, that's the setting. After the death of Joshua. So in its historical setting, God made promises to Abraham that he would make him a great nation, even though he was old and his wife was barren. I'm going to give you a lineage that's going to come after you. You're going to be a great nation, and in your line there will be one who blesses the entire world. He reiterates that promise to Isaac, then to Jacob, and then to Joseph, but he also promises that his people, the people of Israel, will be enslaved for over 400 years. The Lord promises that's going to happen before they go into slavery in Egypt. And after Joseph rises up in Egypt and saves all of his people by the providence of God, they're in slavery for over 400 years. Then the Lord raises up Moses and uses Moses as his instrument, and the Lord sets his people free from slavery in Egypt. They go out into the wilderness, finally getting out from under the grips of the evil Pharaoh at that time. And then they go to Mount Sinai, where the Lord gives them His law. He sets them free, and then He gives them His commands. After that, they wander in the desert for a while because they get to the edge of this promised land that the Lord had promised to give Abraham. Only two of the spies that went in to spy out the land came back and said, we can take it. We can take it. The Lord said He's giving us this land. One of them was Joshua, and the other was Caleb, who we even read about in this book. So they come to the edge of this promised land. The Lord said, go there. I'm going to give you this land. And only two of the spies come back and say, we can do it. The rest of them come back and say, the land is great, and there are giants, and we can't do it. And so they wander in the desert again. They don't take the land at that time. Then they come back to the land years later. Moses doesn't get to enter the promised land. Moses dies before that. But Joshua and Caleb get to. After that, so they come to the edge of Canaan, this promised land that they're supposed to go in and drive all of the Canaanites out of the land who are demon, idol-worshiping people. They're supposed to drive them out. The Lord says, their iniquity, their sin is full. So you're going to go in and wipe them out. The people of Israel are to execute the justice, the judgment, the wrath of God in physical form against these idol-worshiping Canaanites. So the book of Joshua then, which is right before this, reveals that the Lord promised, I'm going to give you the land. And by and large, the people are faithful and do in the book of Joshua what the Lord says to do, by and large. Under the leadership of Joshua, they go and begin to and almost complete the conquest, it's called, of Canaan. And then the book of Judges deals with what happens right after the, the death of Joshua. They don't have a leader anymore. There's no more Moses. There's no more Joshua. There's just, we're just left wondering at the beginning of this book. The whole book covers about 350 years. So we have 21 chapters here, and we're going to do it in 17 weeks, and it covers from our time, like if you just think back, what, what was the state of this land 350 years ago? can't say this nation wasn't. We weren't yet. 350 years is the time period this covers. Well, who's in this book? There are 12 judges highlighted in the book of Judges. That's useful to know because as we study through it, you'll see some of the judges is it's just like this guy named Shamgar was a judge for 20 years, and then he died. It's like, oh, okay, what do we learn about him? Nothing. Why is he mentioned? Most likely because the writer is showing that the Lord raised up judges, not just in one area for one time, or from a few good, big, prominent tribes, 
But the Lord raised up a judge from every tribe in every area of Israel, and all of them end up accomplishing what the Lord wants them to accomplish, but being pretty terrible failures in the end. And they all die. All the tribes have a judge raised up. There's 12 judges, except the tribe of Levi, who were priests. And so there's 12, only 11 tribes. But Joseph had two half-tribes. So two of them are from Joseph's half-tribes. Levi doesn't have a judge raised up because they were the priests. But the last five chapters of this book deals with the Levites, the tribe of Levi. So we have every tribe of Israel. There are 12 tribes. Every tribe in Israel has someone representing them in this book, whether it be a judge or the priests at the end of the book that we see. Why was it written? Well, I've already told you that, but let's zoom in a little bit more. It was written not, not to basically give us a historical chronological layout of what happened in between the time of Joshua and up to the time of King Saul and then King David. It's not, it's not very strictly chronological. The last five chapters of this book, the things that the writer is detailing happen chronologically first at the beginning. And so the writer is not just writing a history so that we would have information commuted to our brains. It's theological. He lays it out in a specific way to show the different judges and the different tribes, and then finally to show the tribe of Levi at the end. And so don't think it's just dry history. All right, we just needed to know what's happening. He writes it in a specific way so that we would learn a great deal about the Lord. So it has to do with theology, which means the study of God. And it also has a great deal to do with anthropology. Say that five times fast. Anthropology, which means the study of human beings. So we learn a great deal about mankind, humans, in this book, and a great deal about the Lord. That's why it's written. So don't for a second think it's dry history. It's written in a theological way so that we would see and long for Jesus. The book of Joshua shows time and time again that the Lord makes a promise and he keeps it. That's the whole book of Joshua, which is right before Judges. The Lord makes a promise. He makes good on every promise. And now the question that hangs in the air with the book of Judges is, will the Lord's people keep their promises? Will the Lord's people keep their promises? Will they be a promise-keeping people? And I want to point you to three things in chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 5. We're not going to look at every single word. It was read to you. We're going to study it all in our study guides together. But I want to point out to you, what do we learn from this? So zooming out a little bit and saying, what do we learn from this? The first thing I want to draw your attention to is this. Half-hearted discipleship is no discipleship at all. First thing we see in this first chapter, in the first five verses of chapter two, is what we can call half-hearted discipleship or half-hearted obedience, half-hearted devotion to the Lord. At, upon first reading, the first part of Judges could seem like, hey, they're, they're continuing the conquest of Canaan. They're doing what the Lord commanded them to do. It's, it's going pretty well. But upon further examination, We'll see what the writer is actually showing us they were doing. And then once you get to verse 27, it becomes very clear they're not doing what the Lord told them to do. Half-hearted discipleship is no discipleship at all. Look at Manasseh, Ephraim, Asher, Naphtali, Dan, and Joseph, starting with verse 27. Just look at that first. Go to verse 27 in your Bible. There's a refrain. He keeps saying the same thing about all these tribes that he mentions. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, 
or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, for the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. When Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. The Lord said, drive them out. They didn't. And what the writer is saying, what's the reason he gives for why Manasseh did not do it? It's at the end of verse 27. For, or you could say because, the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. You guys should leave. Now we don't want to leave. Okay. That's, that's what's going on. They persisted in dwelling there, and Manasseh didn't drive them out like the Lord said. And so there's pragmatism happening here, which means, is this going to work? Should I obey? I don't know if this is going to work. I won't obey. The Lord said, drive them out. He said, I'm, I'm going to strengthen you, and you're going to drive them out. Just go do it. Drive the idol worshipers out of the land. Do not make a covenant with them. Do not intermarry with them. They will be a snare to you because they worship false gods and their iniquity is full and it's time for you to take them out. And they say, yeah, but we're not a big enough army to do that, so I don't think we're going to do that, Lord. That's what's happening. For they insisted on dwelling in the land. And then right after that, verse 28, why does the writer say that? When Israel grew strong, then they did something, but they still didn't obey. When they were strong enough that it made sense, common sense that I think I can accomplish this, our army's bigger now, now we can take care of them, but they still did not drive them out. When Israel, verse 28, when Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out. This is disobedience. They were not told to make slaves of these people and to put them to forced labor. They were told to either kill them or drive them out of the land. But again, this tribe, not obeying the Lord, but because of what made sense to them, I'm not going to attack them because we're not big enough. Now we're big enough, we're going to attack them, but you know what would be really financially beneficial for us? Let's make them do forced labor. We won't drive them out. That's the same thing, right? The Lord won't care half-hearted obedience. They did something, but only when they thought it was wise, only when they thought they were strong enough and they didn't accomplish it in the way the Lord told them to. Like at verse 29 in Ephraim, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. They didn't do what the Lord said. Zebulun, verse 30, did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalal. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. So whoever they could, they brought them and they put them under in forced labor. They made them slaves. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko, or the inhabitants of Sidon, or Ahlob, or Akzib, or Helba, or Apik, or Rehob, or the Asherites, so the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Nephtali did not drive them out. And then go look at the end of verse 35, talking about the Amorites, who pressed the people of Dan and, and the tribes, the house of Joseph rested heavily upon them, and the house of Joseph then put the Amorites, and they subjected them to forced labor. One commentator wrote, The Israelites now live amongst idol-worshipping Canaanites. They made peace with idolatry when the Lord said, Drive the idols, drive the idolaters out. They made peace with them. They live among them, even subjecting them to forced labor, using them. They now live amongst idol-worshipping Canaanites, and like buried mines, these idols lie dormant in chapter 1, ready to explode in the spiritual lives of God's people. That's the setting of what we should see here. Drive out the idol worshipers, because if you don't, 
you will be tempted to worship idols. Get idols out of your life. That's what he's saying. They don't. And so like the commentator says, like buried minds. In Judges chapter 1, they lie dormant, but they're going to explode in the people's lives later in this book even. This is half-hearted discipleship at best. The lesson we need to learn, friends, is this. We can never for a second make peace with idols in our lives. You and I can never for a second make peace with idols in our lives. What is an idol? It's anything or anyone that you are trusting in, hoping in, putting your stock in to make you feel acceptable, to make you feel safe, to make you feel valuable. An idol can be anything or anyone. You can turn any good thing into a false god. It's anything that captures your heart, anything that you would sacrifice for, anything that if you lost it, you would lose your sense of value. Or anything that you're longing for that if you think you got it, then you'd be set. Idols are not just graven images. Idols are things that we take into our heart. And we can never for a second make peace with them. They will always grip our hearts and then they'll break us. As the Apostle John says, the very last verse in his first letter to the churches, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now look at Judah. We'll go back to verse 2. Verses 2 and 3. Look at Judah. Look at the half-hearted discipleship that we see as well here. Verse 2. The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into... What's that word? I have given the land into his, his hand. Judah shall go up. Who's going to go up for us? The Lord says, Judah's going to go up. I've given the land into his hand. And what did Judah do? Hey, Simeon, you want to come with me? Because I know the Lord said he's going to give it into my hand, and I should, I should go up, but I want you to come with me. This seems subtle, but this is direct. The Lord says, Judah goes up. Which tribe goes up? Judah. Judah goes, no, no, Judah and Simeon. The army's too big. I'd like to take Simeon with me as well. And, and he goes up and says, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. There's, the, there's his, I've given him into his hand. The very next verse, Judah goes, no, 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 not he, not his, we. I'm going to take Simeon with me. Again, this is half-hearted. The Lord promises, I'm going to make this happen. And it shouldn't make sense to them. The Lord says, I'm going to make it happen. Go and do it. He says, I get that you promised that, but I'm also going to do it my way, because this makes more sense. Judah's half-hearted as well. And then you can go, go down a little bit further. Go and look at verse 19. We come back to Judah. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. He did not do what the Lord told them to do, and the writer shows us why. They have chariots of iron. That's the most sophisticated army that existed at this time. If you had chariots of iron and you were on a level spot, you're going to take everyone out. They had chariots of iron, and so Judah didn't go down and drive them out. It was like, well, they're on the flatland. I'll, I can take the hill country. That makes sense. When the Lord said, go everywhere and drive them out. So again, we see it's pragmatism. It's what makes sense to Judah. They have chariots of iron. I'm not going down there. The Lord said, the very reason you won the hill country is because of me. I said I'm going to give it to you. Go. But again, the people would rather do what makes sense to them than simply obey the Lord. That's what's happening in chapter 1. 
Joshua chapter 17, verse 18, we read this, this specific promise. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron, and though they are strong. The Lord had already promised them that specific thing. You will drive out the Canaanites. I know they have chariots of iron. You're still going to do it, and I'm going to do it through you. So the point is, the Lord had already promised. It doesn't matter if they're strong. It doesn't matter if they have chariots of iron. Go do what I tell you to do, and you're going to be successful. But Judah, again here, doesn't do what the Lord says. He does it in some sense. Go and drive them out. I'll do what makes sense to me. Drives them out in the hill country, but not in the plain. And we see clearly in the book of Judges that the Lord does this. In chapter 4, with Deborah and Barak, there, are, there is a group of people who have 900 iron chariots. And the people of God are terrified, so they cry out to him. And then Deborah and Barak, they go and drive those people out. Though they had 900 iron chariots. They went and did what the Lord said to do, and they were victorious. This just speaks totally against Judah and what he did in this passage. Friends, it's not our lack of strength. It is not our lack of strength that leads to half-hearted discipleship. It's not you being weak. I'm just weak. That's why I'm not devoted to the Lord. That's why I obey the things that kind of make sense to me. But the more radical parts of the Scripture, it's like, oh, those are for other people. It's not because of your lack of strength or my lack of strength that we are half-hearted in our devotion. It is because of our lack of faith in the promises of God. Your half-hearted discipleship, if you have seasons in your life, you go through that. You have commands in the Scripture that you're ignoring because, ah, I'm just doing my best. And you ignore explicit commands of the Lord in the Bible. It's because you don't trust. You're not in that moment trusting the promises of God. You can always trace back disobedience to a distrust in what God has promised to be and do for his people. Judah, go take them out, even if they have chariots of iron. But they have chariots of iron. I, I said you're going to defeat them. Same thing happens to us in our life, and we have to always trace it back and not go, oh, I'm just weak. The Lord loves weakness. He loves your weakness. He says, come to me if you're weak. That's great. You are weak. You need to know you're weak, and I'll be your strength. Obey me, whether it makes sense to you in the moment or not. When we doubt God's promises, we begin to do what is right in our own eyes. Exactly like the people did in the book of Judges. Rather than by simple faith, obeying Jesus' commands in His Word. And now for one positive example in this passage, look at Caleb and his family. Verses 12 through 15. This is meant to stick out to us. Like, hey, Caleb and his family, did they just did what the Lord said. So and when you just read through it quickly, it's just like, ah, it's just historical information. No, first part, they didn't do what the Lord said. Right after Caleb and his family, they didn't do what the Lord said. After that, didn't do what the Lord said. And then verses 12 through 15 should stand out. Hey, Caleb and his daughter and Othniel, they did what the Lord said. Look at verse 12. Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksaw, we'll go with that, my daughter for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. And he gave Aksaw his daughter for a wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Give me a blessing. Since you have set me in the land of the Negeb, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Who's going to go do this? Well, give him my daughter, Othniel. I'll do it. He went and did it. He obeyed. And then Caleb's daughter and Othniel settled down in the land that the Lord gave them, exactly what the Lord had told them to do. And they settled down, and they had a spring of water there. We're meant to see that. 
We're just supposed to obey. The Lord makes the marching orders, and we gladly obey. Whether we think it's wise or right or... The Lord said, trust my promises, obey my commands. As the old hymn says, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We see here this half-hearted discipleship. And really, half-hearted discipleship is no discipleship at all. Wait till we get to the angel of the Lord. The next thing I want to draw your attention to is that halfway repentance is no repentance at all. Repentance, metanoia in the Greek, the original word, it means a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, that leads to a change of action. But literally, it just means a change of mind, changing your mind. It means an about face. I'm thinking wrongly, therefore I'm feeling wrongly, I'm loving wrongly, and therefore I'm acting wrongly. So repentance is when we're convicted of sin, we acknowledge it, we confess it, and by God's grace we forsake it. We turn from it to faith and obedience to Jesus. That's what repentance is. Broken over sin, confessing the sin, forsaking it. And if you're following Jesus, you're going to be having to do that every day. These people are confronted by the angel of the Lord, and he says, you've not obeyed my voice. And go to the end of our study together today. Look at verse 4, and I want you to notice how the people respond to the angel of the Lord. Before we look at what the angel actually said in detail, look at how they respond to the angel of the Lord. As soon as the angel of the Lord, verse 4 in chapter 2, as soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bakim, which means weepers. And they sacrificed there to the Lord. Seems like a good response. You haven't obeyed my voice. I'm not going to drive them out. I told you to drive them out. You didn't obey me. They're going to be a thorn in your side. They're going to be a snare to you. You haven't kept my covenant. Things are going to get bad for you. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe we did that. Weeping before the Lord. You get beyond that verse and you see the generation that arises didn't know the Lord, didn't care about the Lord, forsook the Lord. This is not repentance. Weeping, lifting your voices and weeping to the Lord, that's not repentance. Repentance is not just being convicted of sin. Repentance is being convicted, yeah, weeping over it, confessing it, turning from it. This is the difference in what the Apostle Paul calls godly grief and or godly grief being good and worldly grief being bad. What they're doing right now is what we, would, what we could just call godly grief, which is what happens to people all the time. I've counseled people numerous times, the same person numerous times, and then other people numerous times that I only get reached out to when they really blow it and they've almost messed up their whole life. They've shipwrecked their faith or they don't even have faith in Jesus and they've just done something ridiculous. And then they want to meet and they want to talk about Jesus and they want to confess and talk about that what they've done is wrong. And then when things get a little bit better in a few weeks, don't hear from them again. That's worldly grief. You're going to reap what you've sown. You've sown some evil or sin and you're gonna, you're, you realize you might reap the harvest of the terrible seeds you've sown. And so, oh my gosh, I can't believe we've done this, Lord. I can't believe I've done that. I'll, I'll do anything for you. They sacrifice to the Lord. I'll do anything for you. I'll give up things for you. Just don't, don't make things so bad. Please, Lord, if you deliver me, I'll never do this again, whatever it may be. That's worldly grief. And it doesn't lead to repentance. It doesn't lead to salvation. It just leads to you feeling better and then you trying to make a deal with God. 
Listen to what Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. He's talking about the fact that his letter to them grieved them. It was sharp in some areas. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. But worldly grief produces death. Godly grief over sin leads, brings about repentance that leads to salvation. But worldly grief produces death. Do not confuse worldly grief over your sin for godly grief that leads to repentance. They're totally different things. And what we see in this passage is this, we could call it halfway repentance. The first part's right. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we've done that. We haven't obeyed the word of the Lord. It's terrible. Lord, I'll give you anything. And you just directly offer, offer sacrifice to the Lord. Do we offer you something? Will you treat us better now? I don't want the thorns. This is halfway repentance. Right after this, they go back to doing what they had just done. Friends, we don't need to just be grieved over our sin. You don't need to just be convicted of your sin. You don't need to just grieve over what you might reap. You need to repent. Another word could be, you need to forsake your sin. Cast it out. Run away from it. Don't be confused in thinking that just grieving over it or crying aloud to the Lord is actually repentance. It could just be worldly grief that Paul says produces death. So don't trick yourself. Pray to God right now that he would convict you of your sin and that when you're convicted, it wouldn't be a worldly grief, but it would be truly a godly grief, sorry for your sin, wanting to forsake it and then walking away from it by the grace of God. Pray to God and ask Him to help you not trick yourself when you're actually just doing worldly grief, worldly halfway repentance, and not actually turning from your sin. The last thing I want to draw your attention to is that it's a hard truth, but the Lord disciplines those He loves. The Lord disciplines those He loves. Look with me at what the angel of the Lord says at the beginning of chapter 2. Now the angel of the Lord. Who is this? Does he say, now an angel of the Lord? No, it's not perfect. The angel of the Lord. Frequently appearing in the Old Testament. Sometimes it's an angel of the Lord. A lot of times it's the angel of the Lord. And what most even conservative commentators will tell you is that this is what we call a Christophany. It means it's an appearance of Christ before he actually came to the earth in the flesh. This is 1,350 years before Christ came as a human being. But notice at the same time, the angel of the Lord, and then usually this happens. The angel starts speaking, and the writer is saying, the Lord says this. So it's as if the person is just standing face to face with the Lord. He's called the messenger of the Lord. So don't try to be confused and think that Jesus is the archangel Michael. And he's a, no, that's not what he's saying. But the angel, angel means messenger, representative, the one bringing the message of the Lord. Who this is, friends, I think clearly. This is the Lord Jesus. We see the same thing in the book of Joshua. When Joshua goes up and he sees the angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army, standing with a drawn sword. Joshua says, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And Jesus says, no. But I'm the commander of the Lord's army. 
I'm for the Lord. The same thing here. I think this is the Lord Jesus. He went up from Gilgal to Bachim, weepers, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Just stop there. The first thing he reminds them of is basically the gospel. I brought you up out of slavery. The Lord says the same thing to you and me. I brought you out of slavery to sin and death. I did it. I swore to give to your fathers this land. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. My commitment to you is total. It'll never stop. It'll never fail. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall not you shall break down their altars. The Lord's promise first. I delivered you by grace. I'm committed to you 100%. I'm your Lord. I'll never break my covenant with you. And I told you. I told you what to do. I told you that I would give you the success. You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you've done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare, a trap to you. And as soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochim, Bochim, which, which means weepers, and they sacrifice there to the Lord. These are stinging words that the angel of the Lord gives to his people. And I want you to contrast how the Lord responds to his people here with how the Lord responds to Adonai Bezek. If you thought we were going to get away from chapter 1 without looking that, think again. Look at what the Lord does to Adonai Bezek through Judah. Adonai, verse 6, Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. They cut off his thumbs and his big toes. At first you go, wow, why? And then we learn why. And Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. That's how the Lord responds to those who are not his. So lest you think it's severe that the Lord says, I'm not going to drive them out. I'm going to leave the thorns in your side. Leave the traps near you. Lest you think that's severe, remember what the Lord did to Adonai Bezek. This, in this passage, we see Lord is disciplining his people. It's not the same as punishment. Discipline means doing something to help correct. And that's what the Lord does. He does it to those he loves. As George Whitfield used to say, the Lord puts thorns in our bed to make us uncomfortable when we are half-hearted or when we're bowing down to idols, making peace with idols in our life, the Lord loves us enough to discipline us, sometimes bringing flat-out suffering upon us, sometimes making us sick. Paul tells the church at Corinth, because of the way they were treating the Lord's table and the Lord's supper, he said, that's why some of you are sick. Because you're not taking the Lord's Supper as you should. Sometimes the Lord makes us sick like that. Sometimes the Lord brings about suffering to wake us up. Rather than letting us drift into a sleep of half-hearted discipleship, half-hearted obedience, the Lord disciplines us to wake us up and make us holy and happy like Him. 
That's the message of Hebrews chapter 12. Go and read the beginning of Hebrews 12. He said, don't you forget that the Lord disciplines every child, every son he receives. If you're being disciplined, it's because the Lord is making you more like Jesus, so that you may share in his holiness. Do not despise then, Christian, the discipline of the Lord. Learn to kiss the rock that slams you against the rock of ages. Learn, learn to kiss the wave that slams you against the rock of ages, as Charles Spurgeon used to say. Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, and profuse or many are the kisses of an enemy. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. And Jesus is the best friend. He'll wound you, and it'll be for your good. Just like the angel of the Lord leaves them there to be thorns, to be a snare, to discipline them, to wake them up. So the book of Joshua shows time and time again the Lord keeps his promises. Judges, we ask, but will we? And the answer already is a resounding no. So what we really need is to be able to uphold our end of the covenant. The angel says, I'll never break my covenant with you. And then he goes, but what have you done? We've broken our end of the deal. A covenant is an agreement. It's an agreement between God and people. And there are stipulations in the covenant. The Lord says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Here's what you must do to uphold your end of the covenant. And we see time and time again throughout the Old Testament, throughout the book of Judges in particular, we have never done it. That's what we really need to happen. The bad news is that no one ever has and no one ever will save one. His name is Jesus. There's only been one who has actually upheld human beings' end of the bargain, and it was the God-man, the one who became a human being as our perfect, perfect representative. His name is Jesus. He's who this passage and our daily lives should drive us to look at and trust. You should see yourselves. I should see myself in Judges chapter 1 and the beginning of 2. We haven't upheld our end of the deal. Not for one second was Jesus, or will he ever be half-hearted in his devotion to God. That's who you need to look at. On the cross, Jesus perfectly paid the debt we owe to God for the fact that we haven't upheld our end of the covenant. On the cross, Jesus took the ultimate thorns. He cast himself into the bigger trap, was destroyed as you and I deserve for being covenant breakers, and he did it as our representative. You have to understand the Old Testament or you won't understand the gospel nearly enough. God makes a covenant, the people have to uphold their end, and they break it, and they break it, and they break it. And then Jesus enters in, becomes a human being. Why? So that he could be our perfect representative, and he could live without sin as we should. He could die for our sin, and then arise as the covenant keeper for the people of God. That's the whole point of the gospel. That's the whole point of the Old Testament. God says, keep my covenant, and the people don't. So Jesus comes in our place, keeps our end of the bargain, so that now if we are in Christ, God will never say, you haven't upheld your end of the bargain because we're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. That's the whole point of the gospel. That's the whole point of passages like this, that we would go, how are we ever going to uphold our end of the bargain? And we would go, we're never going to. But Jesus did. And if your faith is in Jesus, that means every second of every day for the rest of existence, for all of eternity, you will never have the Lord say, you've broken my covenant. 
because you have a representative standing at the right hand of the Father who lived without sin, who died paying for your sin, and who is who's alive. He's the covenant upholder. That's what we need. That's what we have in Jesus. All who trust in him will never be put to shame. If you look to him, you'll find strength in him to be wholehearted in your discipleship and not half-hearted. If you look to Jesus and what he's done for you on the cross, you will be broken over your sin. And you'll be empowered and strengthened to confess it, forsake it. There's nothing that can make you weep and truly repent of your sin like looking at what Jesus did on the cross. That's how high of a price that had to be paid to forgive you of that sin. You want to be broken over your sin? Look at what Jesus did on the cross. That'll break you. And you can repent. If you look to Jesus and what he's done on the cross, you'll learn to love the discipline of the Lord. You'll look at the cross and see, I deserve punishment. I deserve death and destruction because Jesus has taken that for me. All I get is the loving discipline of my Father to make me more holy and more happy. Look to Jesus. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for the book of Judges. We ask for you to be glorified. Impress your word in our minds, on our hearts, so that we may not sin against you. And so that when we do, we may cling to our advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. We ask you to make us who are in Christ more like Jesus. We ask you to save sinners. Help us to not be half-hearted in our discipleship. Help us to not be half-hearted in repentance or have worldly grief over our sin. Help us to have godly grief, to be devoted to you, and to learn to love your discipline. Save and sanctify, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.